Okay. Greetings all. Welcome to a special Facebook Live event focusing on absinthe, the deadly elixir, uh, the drink of the gods. I want to thank my friends at the Amazon conservation team, particularly Antonio Peluso, who's my right hand person on these Facebook Live events and at the Amazon conservation team. And I want to thank Deb Mitchell Associates, uh, for their incredible help, which is what makes Plants of the Gods possible. I'm Mark Plotkin, Dr. Mark Plotkin of the Amazon Conservation Team. I'm an ethnobotanist. I've been focusing on plants and peoples, primarily the Amazon, for much of the last four decades. But I have a broader interest, which is the relationship between plants and people. And I say bland, plants in the broad sense, which includes uh, fungi, uh, even magic frogs in a very broad sense. And that is the focus of the podcast. And you can find Plants of the Gods podcast on all major platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you find them. We're in our third season. Uh, we've just crossed north of 260,000 downloads. So we have quite a following. And I'd like to uh, toast everybody who's been listening in uh, with some absinthe. Uh, we'll be talking a lot more about that. But just to get the ball rolling here, I'd like to know where people are dialing in from. So in the chat section, please uh, give us a, a shout out and let us know where you're uh, calling in or dialing in from. That's always useful and interesting to us. I also want to encourage people to ask questions or make comments, criticisms, constructive criticisms, because I like to make these sessions as interactive as possible. I'm not here to lecture for 60 minutes. I also and always like to hear what people are thinking, what piques their interest. And though we're going to focus on absent, the green fairy, so-called, today, I want to make this a little bit more broad, uh, broad ranging and um, talk about all plants and fungi and magic frogs of the gods. I also want to steer you to a new episode of Plants of the Gods, which dropped yesterday with the great Paul Stamets. I know many of you have seen a fantastic fungi. If you haven't, that's your homework. Allá uh, está la, la tarea. Uh, to watch this incredible documentary, one of the best I've ever seen, I've watched it three times, it talks about fungi and their impact on our species, past, present, and future. And the star of the show is my old friend Paul Stamets, S-T-A-M-E-T-S. He does a lot of social media. He's done TED Talks. He's done Bioneer Talks. Very easy to find. Uh, on the internet, written a bunch of books, classic works on psilocybin for people who like that sort of thing. Um, so this episode marks uh, a new tact. Three and a half seasons has just been me as a talking head, but I wanted to invite in a guest and make it a special guest. That's Paul Stamets. So please tune into that episode of Plants of the Gods. Here's to Paul and all of our listeners. But let's talk uh, about absinthe. And, and as I, I say that, I want to point out that I'm off to Costa Rica very soon, my second trip back to the rainforest since the pandemic has started winding down. The Amazon conservation team's having a board meeting there, and we're going to talk about the issues of plants and people and how best to protect them. And that's Antonio Peluso, uh, my wingman on this Facebook Live. Do you have something you want to share with us, Antonio? No, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. And yes, before we hopped into absinthe, um, we have already a couple of questions, but I thought now it'd be good to ask you one about the podcast. Um, and first we have 
Yeah, someone's asking, what was your favorite episode to research and create? Well, hmm, interesting question. I have to say my favorite episode is the first one, Ayahuasca. Uh, and that's because I've spent 40 years researching it. Uh, it's actually the most popular episode of, of the close to 30 that we've done. And one of the reasons I launched uh, Plants for the Gods is because I have a very different perspective on hallucinogens than do most people because I've been studying them and taking them for so long uh, from a scientific perspective. But I've also been studying these and taking these with indigenous colleagues and teachers. So these are two different uh, viewpoints. I find them complementary. Some people think that they're totally in opposition. I disagree. But ayahuasca is my favorite because it's like, you know, your first kid, right? It's first time around, first time out of the block. And it was really just me sitting there with a microphone talking and telling stories. So Plants of the Gods has grown since then. But I have to say that of all the episodes uh, everywhere on ayahuasca, that holds a special place in my heart and in the heart of many others. And in fact, I'm going to do one more episode on ayahuasca, and it will be called Richard Schulte's in the Vine of the Soul, because it was my mentor, Schulte's, who made the first scientific documentation of ayahuasca in situ. And I tell more of that in the in the ayahuasca episode, but it seems to be an endless amount of uh, interest in this incredible vine, which was once uh, essentially a potion known and used and consumed and worshipped by a couple of Amazonian tribes in the northwest Amazon. And now people are taking ayahuasca from India to Indonesia to Israel to Istanbul. No, thank so, you. That sounds fascinating. And we already know I've learned a lot about Schultes myself from uh, some of the previous episodes as it is. So very much looking forward to that episode. Well, I have to say that my uh, episode on Schultes, of which there's a couple, but the first one uh, is also one of our most popular episodes. And again, it's because I was a student. I lived in his house. I worked in his herbarium that I, I knew him so well. But I think ayahuasca and absinthe have several things in common, the most important of which is the idea of the ideogen, I-D-E-A, I-D-E-O-G-E-N. This is a concept devised by my colleague, uh, Abigail Wright, who made the film The Shaman's Apprentice. I said, look, hallucinogens make you hallucinate. Uh, they're also known as empathogens because they make you feel empathy. Uh, some people call them entheogens because they release the God within. But there's an aspect to altered states, which is about creativity. And if you look at Kerry Mullis, the guy who invented the polymerase chain reaction, if you haven't looked that up, it's really, it's revolutionized our society, everything from cracking these cold cases to figuring out the genetics of ancient mummies of Egypt. And he did that after taking LSD. So the use of these mind altering substances, and in, in, in that I include wine and liquor, not just plant hallucinogens, uh, as something which enhances creativity. And that's where ab absinthe comes to the fore, because absinthe ruled the world during the Belle Epoque, the end of the 19th century, when France ruled the world in terms of art and literature, and all those guys were drinking absinthe each and every day and much of the night. You know, the idea of the ideogen is something which enhances creativity. It goes at least as far back as Horace, the poet laureate of ancient Rome, who said, no poem was ever written by a drinker of water. And that's why one of the popular episodes we've done on Plants of the Gods is on the ethnobotany of wine, that wine was the original mind-altering substance. In fact, some people uh, have come up with a theory, basically put forward by the late Terence McKenna, called the uh, stoned ape theory, which is why did human brains expand widely 100,000 years ago? And Terence said it was because that's when they discovered hallucinogenic mushrooms and other mind-altering substances. That was the origin of human consciousness. But not to be outdone by Terence, others have put forward a theory called the stoned ape theory, which is that when our ancestors were living in the trees, and living on fruits. Well, the ripest fruits fell to the forest floor, and the ripest fruits are the sweetest fruits. So they left the trees to come down to eat the ripest fruits. Now, really ripe fruits, speaking from a botanical perspective, start to ferment their sugars. And so it wasn't stoned aped, it was drunk monkeys. I actually think it was both. In, in either case, 
the point is that these plant substances, like wormwood, which is what absinthe is made from, uh, generate different uh, generate different states of mind, altered states, if you will. And Andrew Weil, I'm sure many of you know Andrew Weil, W-E-I-L, the very famous physician who really brought complementary medicine to the attention of the Western world. What few people realize is Andy Weil started out as a student of Schulte's. Andy Weil was an ethnobotanist before he was a doctor. And it was Andy who said, if you don't think that altered states are part of human nature, then why do kids spin around in a circle till they get so dizzy they fall over? So that there's something in our mind, in our heart, in our soul, which wants us, which makes us strive to alter our state uh, at some point. Now that can be, you know, drinking a glass of wine or smoking a joint, which apparently is legal in some states, if any of you ever tried that, or having a glass of absinthe or a glass of wine. That these foster creativity and these help us deal with stress. Western medicine doesn't have uh, a cure for stress, but drinking absinthe, drinking wine, drinking beer, and we'll do an episode on beer, the ethnobotany beer at some point, uh, is one way of dealing with stress. Now, you just saw the the uh, meme of the green fairy. The absinthe has long been known as the green fairy. And here's the story behind that. In the Belle Epoque of France, uh, they developed a very ritualistic way of a drinking absinthe that wasn't just swigging it out of a bottle, that they would take a glass of water, they developed a slotted spoon, especially for this, would lay it across the top of the glass of water, would put a sugar cube on top of the spoon, because absinthe is quite bitter, and they would pour water over it. And when the water would get enter the glass, it would create this sort of cloudy uh, color change which is, it's, it's, it's part of the rituals. It's a nice thing to see. And if you had enough absinthe, it looks like a fairy. Uh, when you see these clouds forming, uh, it looks like fairy wings. And if you drink enough absinthe, you could see just about anything. Now, this gets to the question of, is absinthe hallucinogenic? I don't think so. I think the power of absinthe, the attraction of absinthe, is the alcoholic content of absinthe. So serious uh, a problem did alcoholism become around people addicted to absinthe, they, 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 they developed a medical term for it, absinthism. But the current thinking, and not everybody agrees, is that it's just alcoholism. And consider this, the alcohol content of wine is about 12%. The alcoholic content of rum is about 40%. The alcoholic content of absinthe is somewhere between 70 and 90%. I mean, this is almost like drinking moonshine or green alcohol. So if you drink this stuff, it, it, it has the, the kick of a mule, which is why it's important to drink it in moderation. It's important to drink it uh, mixed with water. Some of these Belle Epoque artists, here you see the visions uh, in absinthism. And, and absinthe inspired an incredible amount of artwork, particularly during the Belle Epoque, about the green fairy, about the invisible goddess. And when you look at the pictures of these absinthe drinkers, you can see where people coined the term absinthism as an addiction. Some of the most famous artists of the Belle Epoque, some of the most famous artists who ever lived, did very famous paintings of absinthe and absinthe drinkers. This is by Van Gogh. Now, Van Gogh, of course, was one of the uh, most famous artists who ever lived. But if you look at his paintings, these swirls of color, which, you know, hadn't been seen before, are often greens and yellows. And uh, some have attributed this to his overconsumption of absinthe. Now, now, he was a real substance abuser. It wasn't just absinthe. I mean, he was drinking turpentine. The fellow really had a lot of demons uh, plaguing him, which this type of alcoholism just brought it on even further. But all of these popular, famous uh, painters and, and, and poets and artists, uh, this is Picasso. Okay, this is a Picasso. This is clearly absinthe. You see the seltzer uh, bottle next to the glass of absinthe because uh, most people, uh, most people w w would, would drink this with water. It's just too damn strong to drink it straight up. And you have to remember, Picasso was the most famous uh, painter of the 20th century, and he adored absinthe. And uh, it featured in, in a lot of his artwork. In fact, one of his cubist creations uh, was called The Glass of Absinthe, but one of the writers 
on absinthe says, and you'd be hard pressed to find where the glass of absinthe is, because in Cubism, it's not always easy to figure out exactly what's what's going on. But um, I, I, I like how people who have analyzed, I want to recommend two books. I have one with me right here. It's Absinthe, History in a Bottle by Barnaby Conrad. It's, it's a good overview of absinthe, the history, and particularly its impact on artwork. And Conrad said that the history of absinthe is one of murder, madness, and despair. Phil Baker wrote the other book that I like, and there's lots of books on absinthe. Uh, Phil Baker wrote the book of absinthe, easy to remember. And he said, the history of absinthe has some sobering themes, addiction, ruin, and mortality. So clearly, no matter how much it inspired people, it ruined uh, a lot of lives. And I don't want to give the impression here that, you know, just getting into an ulcer today, just getting drunk or, or buzzed auto automatically makes you uh, creative. I mean, I remember being in college in the 70s, and we used to think that, well, if you, if you smoke a lot of dope, you'll be even more creative. That's not always that's not always true. And Baker summed it up by people thinking if they just drank more absinthe, they would be creative geniuses. Baker wrote, absinthe was the genius of those who didn't have any genius on their own, and the death of any real genius who did. Uh, the British poet Ernest Dowson, uh, who's probably better known for his quips than his poetry, said that whiskey and beer are for fools, but absinthe is for poets. He also said, memorably, that absinthe makes the tart grow fonder. Hemingway himself, now remember Hemingway was, of course, the greatest novelist of the 20th century. Hemingway wrote, quote, absinthe is the idea changing liquid alchemy. So he was very much a lover of absinthe. And I want to talk about Hemingway and Spain and the role of Spain in the history of absinthe, because people tend to associate it with uh, France. But when absinthe ended up in New Orleans, and I did a whole episode on absinthe in New Orleans, uh, it was really the Spaniards that were much more responsible for it than were the French. You know, what people don't realize is that uh, New Orleans is a very Spanish city. We all know about the French Quarter. We know about Bienville and Iberville, who founded it. But the Spanish actually took over New Orleans for an extended period. Uh, this was during the, the Napoleonic Wars. And they took it from the French, and then they sold it back to Napoleon. And then Napoleon sold uh, New Orleans and the Mississippi Valley to the Americans in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase. So it changed hands several times. I think my home state of Louisiana has had more flags flying over it than any other state in the Union. That's uh, there are eight or nine or ten flags that have flown over New Orleans. So again, th this rich mosaic of culture, uh, it wasn't just about the French and the Americans. The Spaniards played a, a, a big role as well, as did the pirates, which I talked about in our episode on rum, slavery, and uh, and piracy. So absinthe actually can be traced back to the ancient world. In our episode on the ethnobotany of wine, I talked about the fact that the Ebers papyrus is the most famous medicinal papyrus of, of ancient Egypt. And as far back as the Ebers papyrus, thousands of years ago, the Egyptians realized that wormwood, wormwood is artemisia. It is the genus of, uh, that is made into absinthe. That's, that's the plant there. It smells like licorice. It's a very common weed. Uh, everybody has seen this thing, whether they realize it or not. So the ancient Egyptians used this medicinally. The ancient Greeks used this medicinally and the ancient Romans used this medicinally. And they used it for many things, but they all used it for fever. And I want to get back to fever because that's an important part of the story. You know, in our culture here in the industrialized West, we, uh, we, we tend to separate food and medicine. And that is not a distinction that many other cultures make. Uh, when the uh, great Roman physician, uh, not Paracelsus, the uh, physician to the gladiators that I, uh, Galen, was asked, what's the difference between a food and a medicine? He said, most memorably, that a food is something that the body acts upon, and a medicine is something which acts upon the body, which is a, a great quote. But again, that's too simple. So 
you had these guys making tea uh, for more thousands of years ago. Then distillation was invented. And very few people seem to realize or know how distillation and why distillation was invented. And here's why. Wine makes itself. Beer needs to be made. And what I mean by that is grapes will fall off the grapevine and ferment. And that's essentially wine. However, beer needs to be made. We'll be getting into that in the beer episode. But these are very low content alcohol drinks. If you want to get to bourbon and rum and absinthe, you got to distill it. Distillation means taking these alcoholic beverages uh, made from grapes or grains, whatever, and boiling out the water, which decreases the water content, which increases the alcohol content. Here's how we think distillation was invented by the Arabs, because when Muhammad outlawed the drinking of alcohol, alcohol was verboten. However, the greatest physicians in the world at that time were Arabs, were Muslims, and they knew that alcohol was important medicinally. So they had to find a way to give you the benefits of alcohol without you having to you know, lug around big kegs of beer. And so they boiled down uh, the wine and, and the beer and these other things to create a, strong, a stronger drink. And so I, 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 ironically, by forbidding uh, the wide use and consumption of alcohol, you created a hard liquor. It's just one of the great ironies uh, of, of history. Now, as I said, uh, not till you got this distillation did you have absinthe. And absinthe, as we know it in drinking, is a very distilled form of uh, wormwood or wormwood tea. This became uh, popular in Europe because of the French army. The French army, which went off to do bad things for the most part in the tropical world uh, through much of the Mediterranean, they were issued absinthe liqueur because the water was bad. Another reason that alcohol became so popular is you can drink it. It's not going to be full of cooties, okay? So that uh, an army, as Napoleon memorably said, uh, crawls on its stomach. But if that stomach is full of uh, dysentery, it doesn't crawl very far. Um, so by giving people alcohol to drink, whether it was wine or absinthe or other liqueurs, they could not only drink the stuff straight, but more importantly, they could add it to the water and, and kill the, the bug, kill the protozoans. So when the French army came back from these wars, particularly from the colonial wars in Algeria, uh, absinthe became very popular. It was considered kind of rakish to, to be an absinthe drinker. And then you develop this whole... Uh, culture around it, uh, which had a lot of negative aspects, as, as you can see here. You see the fellow pouring the water into the absinthe. Um, it really caused a lot of addiction. And, you know, I, I, I want to point out that all of these plant products, fungal products, uh, can have a downside. And absinthe is a, a perfect example of that when you consider all the misery and alcoholism that resulted. So everything in, in moderation. Another thing that made absinthe even more popular was the phylloxera, uh, the phylloxera epidemic. Phylloxera was a little bug that was brought, it's believed to have been brought uh, from the US to Europe when they were moving uh, vines around. And this decimated the French wine industry. This was in the 1850s. And so all of a sudden wine became more popular uh, I mean, more expensive, making absinthe uh, more more popular, more available, more more affordable, essentially. So, you know, we, we like to think of capitalism as you're trying to sell your stuff for the best price. But there's an ugly side of capitalism which doesn't get as much attention, which is to screw with the products of your competition. So if you are trying to promote absinthe because you're an absinthe distiller, uh, you want to see uh, wine... Uh, not do as well or become more expensive. That's capitalism red in uh, tooth and claw. So I'm wondering, uh, Antonio, do we have any questions? Oh, I was muted. Hey, Martin. Martin. There was one, but I think you might have already answered a little bit of it here. Let me pull it up. Um, so you have a couple of episodes about absinthe already. And in your second absinthe, episode 
you talk about or you make a case that the Spanish played a really important role in the history of absinthe. Um, and the question was, can you tell us a little bit more about that? But you touched on that a little bit, but do you have anything else you'd like to expand on? Like why the Spanish were so important in the history of absinthe? It's a good question. I, I think because this became so popular in the Belle Epoque, which was, you know, Paris in the 1890s, you got to remember who was this identified with? Toulouse Lautrec, Edward Degas, Vincent van Gogh, Paul Verlaine, the poet, Baudelaire, the poet, Rimbaud, the poet, and Oscar Wilde were all uh, tremendous consumers of absinthe. However, there was another one there that was a consumer of absinthe who was part of the same circle, and that was Pablo Picasso. But obviously, Picasso was not a Frenchman. He was a Spaniard. And when people became alarmed or overly alarmed about absinthe and so-called absinthism, it was banned in much of Europe. But it was not banned in Spain. And the most famous writer about absinthe was Hemingway. Now, Hemingway wasn't a Spaniard or a Frenchman. He was an American. But Hemingway did his drinking and his writing in Spain. And when he spent time in the New World, he was in Cuba. So thanks to the Spaniards keeping the tradition and the availability of absinthe alive, there was a Spanish component to maintaining the availability of absinthe to the outside world. Here's where it impacts uh, my hometown in New Orleans. This is the very famous old absinthe house on the corner of Bourbon and Bienville. It still stands. I've been there many times. And Alistair Crowley, who called himself the Great Beast, he was a very famous British ne'er-do-well poet, novelist, uh, flamboyantly bisexual practitioner of black magic, major influence on Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. Uh, Alistair Crowley wrote a very famous novel sitting at the bar in, in the Absinthe House. Here's what even New Orleanians don't realize. The Absinthe House was built uh, and opened by Spaniards. They ran a grocery there. Okay, so it was Spaniards who played a key role in the popularity of uh, Absinthe in New Orleans. And they sold Absinthe there long after Absinthe had been banned. So there's uh, my father during World War II, standing on Bienville Street, that's Bourbon Street on the left-hand side of the picture, uh, right in front of the old Absinthe House. It's a New Orleans institution, still stands. And uh, as far as uh, giving everybody an assignment in this class, I assign all of you to go to where my dad's standing and have a drink of Absinthe at the old Absinthe House. It'll be well worth it. So um, any other questions that I... Yeah, no, absolutely. And that picture of your father on the on the corner in front of the absinthe house is just astonishing. It's a really beautiful photo. Um, but we have one in from Lawrence Curtis. Uh, here, it, here goes. Amazingly informative. Where did the stigma against absinthe originate or anti-intellectual anti intellectualism? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and you know, in, in doing the Plants of the Gods podcast, you see the same patterns. Something becomes popular, something becomes anti-establishment, and, and people push back. So, you know, much of the movement against marijuana, I mean, nobody would argue, nobody in their right mind would argue that marijuana is more deleterious than liquor and, and alcohol, okay? But when, alcohol, when marijuana became popular, particularly amongst the uh, poorer classes, uh, amongst Latinos and Blacks, it was seen sort of as a threat to the establishment. And you had this wicked overreaction against the evils of, 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 of marijuana. Uh, it's not dissimilar with absinthe, I think. I think it, it sort of became popular. And remember when it became widely popular amongst artists, uh, these are the original anti-establishment types. Uh, actually, absinthe is a lot more addictive than marijuana, for example. And so you had this overreaction. It was temperance people against it. You know, the, 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 the same people that brought us the joys of prohibition overreacted against it. And, you know, from a cynical perspective, when you, some people just, when they see other people enjoying something, they want them to knock it off. It's, 
I mean, me, I'd like to know what's so enjoyable and, and, and have a taste. But I think this was off-putting to people who, you know, saw people having a good time. And certainly uh, the addiction aspect. You saw the artwork and there's plenty more of it, especially if you look at Barnaby Conrad's book of, of people just staring off into space, uh, bacon-eyed because of their uh, overindulgence and absinthe or even their addiction. Uh, David, don't we have that Manet photo of the absinthe drinker? Um, absinthe is uh, readily available now. It was made legal once again, so it has died. It was born, died, and has been reborn. That should appeal to all of you Catholics out there, uh, that it's easy to find. And it is... Um, and do you see uh, this other question? Uh, Sorry. Pardon? Interrupt. We have another question in here, if you're ready. Yeah. From Marco Tellez. Um, some have said that the real, the real absinthe and hallucinations, it comes from absinthe produced in Chile and France. Um, is that true, or is that a myth, or do you have any other info about this? It's not true. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a chemist, but I will say that I've done a lot of reading because there is this debate as to whether it's addictive or not. There's a compound in absinthe called thujone, T-H-U-J-O-N-E. Look it up. There's lots of stuff on the net about it. Uh, whether this was the secret addictive compound, and the single most recent reference uh, I found trustworthy one is the absent. I mean, the Oxford Book of Spirits, which is my go-to on a lot of stuff. They have an excellent one on wine. Uh, they have stuff on food. It's all based on science, and they say no, there is no conclusive scientific evidence that it is addictive. So uh, there are people who say, oh yes, well, from this country, addictive, but from there, it's not. And all of my research indicates. Uh, that's not the case. But I will say this, as an ethnobotanist, you're trained to never say, never. And let's talk about hallucinogenic mushrooms. Because the Spaniards, when they conquered the Aztecs, wrote that the Indians, the indigenous peoples, the Aztecs were taking hallucinogenic mushrooms for divinatory purposes, that is to communicate with the gods. And uh, nobody knew that there were any hallucinogenic mushrooms except outside of Siberia, on the other side of the planet. So for 500 years afterwards, people were writing, there's no such thing as hallucinogenic mushrooms. There was a guy named Safford, a very famous ethnobotanist at the Smithsonian, who said, actually, the Aztecs were taking peyote. They were just misleading the Spaniards by claiming it was mushrooms. Well, while my mentor, Schultes, was working in the herbarium on peyote, he found a note from a Mexican physician saying, no, uh, Tionanacatl, the Aztec name for magic mushrooms, uh, is not peyote. It is magic mushrooms, and it does exist in uh, Oaxaca in southern Mexico. Now, it took Schultes and, and later Wasson uh, several expeditions to, to really document this. Okay, this was not something in the people's readily shared with the outside world because, you know, magic mushrooms, which had once been used over a lot of Mexico, have been reduced to just about three tribes in southern Mexico because of pressure from the church. So this is why you learn never to say never, but you can say safely and accurately, uh, for all intents and purposes from what I've seen, uh, there is no difference in hallucinogenic activity between the absent produced in one country versus another. But I will say this, uh, in an age where chemists are discovering plants of the gods, and people are engineering all sorts of crazy new compounds. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to find somebody uh, producing a hallucinogenic absinthe, um, but I don't know of it yet, which again, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and I don't wanna give anybody ideas, but as far as I know, and I think that's the longest answer to the shortest question in any Facebook live we've done. Well, we have another <laughs> good question. I think there's a good follow-up that's here on the screen from Dylan. Mayat, excuse me if I didn't say that right. Um, you can see it up there. Um, but so they're saying that they heard that the reason for people hallucinating off of absinthe is because that they were drinking out of something that included lead. Um, is there, they also followed up and asked, is there any truth to that theory or is this something that you're aware of? You know, it's interesting to, to think about lead, which we think of as terrible and poisonous, which it is. 
Uh, we worry about it showing up in the drinking supply and old systems and poor neighborhoods. Uh, but interestingly, the Rome, the Romans, the ancient Romans used to drink it in their wine because it apparently imparts a sweet taste. Well, there were many things that led to the downfall of Rome. Uh, lead poisoning may well have been one. There, there, there were certain pipes made of lead, so they didn't realize that the toxicity of it. I don't think that anybody uh, willingly uh, drinks out of uh, anything lead these days, um, but humanity's capacity for stupid uh, self-destruction seems to be pretty endless. But I don't know of any accounts where if you drink it out of a lead cup, you'll start tripping. But I will say this, uh, as I just mentioned, the fall of Rome was attributed to many different things. Uh, the invasion of the barbarians, uh, the fact that the empire overexpanded, um, the deforestation, which I covered in the episode, the, the podcast episode on the ethnobotany of warfare. But uh, malaria was part of it. Rome, uh, Imperial Rome, the city, not, not the empire in particular, suffered terribly from malaria. Malaria swept in from the Pontine Marshes, southeast of the city of Rome. I think those were only drained by the Emperor Claudius that I talked about in the mushroom episode. And that when I visited Pompeii about 20 years ago, now Pompeii, most of you know, it's the ancient city. It was the, the, the capital of, of wine production for the city of Rome. It's in, essentially, it's near Naples. And uh, in visiting this ancient city, which was destroyed in the eruption of Vesuvius in year 79, uh, I was poking around to see what I could see. And I saw the most interesting thing. And it wasn't a ruined building, and it wasn't a shrine, and it wasn't a mosaic. It was wormwood growing in gardens. And it made me think, maybe this is what the Romans were using against malaria. Because in 2015, a Chinese scientist won the Nobel Prize for finding a new compound for uh, treating, preventing, and curing malaria. And that compound is called artemisinin. And it comes from wormwood, which is the genus Artemisia. And the reason it's called Artemisia is the goddess of the hunt, Artemis, uh, also known as the goddess Diana, gave Artemis as a medicinal gift and blessing to the centaur Chiron. Chiron centaur is, of course, the half man, half horse. And Chiron, C-H-I-R-O-N, was the centaur who taught Hercules and mankind, people kind, uh, about medicinal plants. So an homage to the goddess or the, the, the legend of the goddess, the genus is Artemisia. But the more important point is that uh, this woman deservedly won the Nobel Prize for bringing this medicine to the wide world. But I suspect it was the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, and the ancient Egyptians who uh, understood this long before we did. And we find this time and time again that ancient peoples uh, primitive peoples, indigenous peoples, uh, marginalized peoples know a lot more than me do. And my, 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 my buddy Paul Stamets, the mycologist, says that minorities by definition live on the edge of the mainstream and the edge is where the action is, that many of the, the greatest human creations, uh, whether it was fire or whether it was wormwood, uh, tend to come from marginalized populations which is why we shouldn't just always listen to scientists. We need to listen to people without PhDs. Uh, I know in my own work, sometimes listen to people without last names uh, or preliterate people still not to write. They may still be geniuses. Other, uh, other uh, questions, uh, Antonio? I, I, well, let me, let's take a break here for a second. I'd like to invite people to dial in and tell us where they're dialing in from. It's always useful and interesting to us to know uh, who we're reaching. And as I said, I wanna make this uh, an interactive conversation. So I'd like to uh, ask you guys, uh, if you're enjoying these Facebook Lives, I've, I've done a handful of them, and ask you, invite you to suggest what other topics you'd like to hear more about. I know that we've had uh, some requests to do more about uh, the ethnobotany of beer. Uh, I'm going to do one on Amanita muscaria. This is the mushroom that gave rise to Santa Claus and Christmas. But, I, you know, if I wanted to sit in, in front of a bunch of 19-year-olds and lecture at them a couple hours a week, I'd be in academia, which I left a long time ago. 
So my challenge to you guys is to tell me and tell us uh, what you'd like to hear more of, more chemistry, more ethnobotany, more hallucinogens, and uh, scribble in where you're dialing in from. And I also want to point out that this Facebook Live uh, will go up on the internet. Um, so if you like what you heard or you have friends that you want to dial in, uh, check us out. And again, I'm the host of the podcast Plants of the Gods. We're on all the major uh, podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, things like that. And you can find more about Plants of the Gods, uh, more about the Amazon Conservation Team at amazonteam.org and about my uh, personal website, markplotkin.com. So with that, while I'll we're ask for people, While we're waiting for people to, to kind of write in here in the comments, can you tell us a little bit about the preparation and ritual of the drink itself? Of, of absinthe? Yes. Yeah, there you go. You see the sugar cube sat on the slotted spoon, uh, water dripped onto it so that the sugar water drips into the absinthe and generates the chemical reaction. And that in this particular case, you're setting the sugar cube on fire, which introduces a sort of caramel flavor. So I don't think this has a whole lot to do with chemistry. I think it's just kind of fun and tasty. But, you know, ritual is part of a lot of aspects of, 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 of daily life. And uh, coming up with this absinthe ritual and the changing of the colors and the appearance of the green fairy in the glass uh, is just a lot more interesting than, than knocking back a beer. So that's why they call it the green fairy, that you see the fairy wings in the glass once the water uh, drips into the absinthe. And the more absinthe you drink, the more you see. So, thank you. Other yeah, questions, great. Antonio? Um, I think it's, oh, yeah, here we go. We have one on the screen. Uh, what do you think of the representation of absinthe in Hollywood, like Bram Stoker's Dracula? Thank you to Joseph Stevens for asking that. That <laughs> is uh, something which I think underscores my point of it being about ritual, uh, imagination, and creativity. It's sort of the drink of heaven and hell. And, you know, it wasn't like they, they poured out a little shot of bourbon or uh, a tot of rum. It's about absinthe because it's mysterious, it's powerful, it's mind-altering and stuff like that. So, yeah, I love seeing these artistic representations of it. It's very cool. And, you know, when you when you produce a work of art, whether it's a, a film or a painting, you, you want to get your audience to react. You want to get them to emote. And absinthe with the mystery attached to it and the fact that it's, you know, the drink of the night, uh, vampires roam the night. Uh, you had all these artists inspired by it. If you read some of these books, driven to madness by it, that, uh, yeah, it has a special appeal. But, uh, you know, I, 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 one of the points I wanna make here is that uh, I, I think it's very important to emphasize the role of mind altering drinks that are not hallucinogenic and that uh, and that you, you seldom see this in, in much of the literature on hallucinogens. Schulte's book, Plants of the Gods, Origins of Hallucinogenic Use, written in uh, collaboration with Albert Hoffman, the chemist who invented LSD, the chemist who isolated, synthesized psilocybin, uh, they don't touch on alcohol. Okay, it's overlooked. And from my particular perspective on the role uh, of creativity, and healing of, of these mind-altering substances. It's very important. So we've done episodes on rum, uh, we've done uh, on wine, and, and now this one. I think these need to be considered plants of the gods uh, for the same reason. And when I say plants of the gods, again, I emphasize, I, I mean that in the broad sense, because when you talk about hallucinogens, everybody thinks, of course, you know, psilocybin, uh, fantastic fungi, uh, magic mushrooms, but fungi are not plants. Okay, when I was uh, a student, uh, mycology, uh, fungalology was always taught in botany class. Little, sort of like fun fungi were plants that weren't smart enough to photosynthesize. It's not true. Genetic research has revealed that uh, fungi are closer to humans uh, than they are to plants. Let me say that again, because most people don't think they heard it right. Fungi are more closely related to humans than they are to plants. And because of this, 
uh, I talked about the origin of, of, of magic mushrooms, uh, how we first found magic mushrooms, Schultes, Hoffman, uh, Robert Graves, the classic scholar who wrote by Claudius at the ESPD conference uh, last month in England. This is the ethno uh, pharmacological search for new psychedelic drugs. And one of the keynotes was uh, Paul Stamets, great mycologist I mentioned earlier. He's featured in the film Fantastic Fungi, which I can't recommend strongly enough. And, you know, Stamets has created a lot of intriguing ideas and theories. I'm often asked about microdosing. I refer people to the Stamets stack, S-T-A-M-E-T-S. Uh, as a way to do microdosing, should you decide to indulge. And there's a big debate in the scientific community, the medical community, because all these people are microdosing, that is taking teeny tiny amounts of hallucinogens, whether it's psilocybin or LSD or ayahuasca, and claiming all sorts of wonderful effects, you know, uh, decreased anxiety, increased uh, creativity, uh, decreased insomnia. But there's no scientific evidence as to whether it works or how it works or very limited and very unconvincing. Well, Stamets, two weeks ago, released a paper using the TAP test, just like this, to show very strikingly how microdosing can uh, enhance your acuity and uh, presumably uh, enhance neurogenesis. So that is the regeneration of nerve cells. Um, as you age, you know, you lose all sorts of connections and, um, just uh, ability to deal with detail, uh, all sorts of acuity. And he showed in a very convincing fashion, I thought, um, that, that microdosing can reverse this, certainly halt it and probably reverse it. So uh, we'll put this up in the end notes in, in the next couple of days. Um, but look at the Plants of the Gods most recent episode, which is uh, me in, in conversation with, with Stamets. Uh, and check out his webpage. I think it's paulstamets.com. And also be sure and watch Fantastic Fungi. And also I should add, there's a new series about to drop uh, done by my pal, Michael Pollan, um, which is, uh, it's, it's not quite ready yet, but it'll be everywhere. There'll be great coverage of this. Uh, I highly recommend this. I haven't seen it, but knowing Pollan and his work, it's going to be first rate. Oh, absolutely. No, thank you, Mark. We actually have a clip um, that we'd like to show um, of fantastic fungi. Um, and we also have, for everybody to know, a uh, part two of our interview or Mark's interview with, uh, with Paul Stamets. Uh, that'll be coming out in a couple of weeks here. So keep your, you know, keep your eyes peeled for that. My mission is to discover the language of nature and I believe nature is intelligent. There is a world under the earth full of magic and mystery. It holds the consciousness of nature's connection to all living things. You know, these mushrooms, they can heal you, they can feed you, they can kill you. It's not like a vegetable and it's not like a animal, but it's somewhere in between. They support life, they convert life. As you're walking through, there's about 300 miles of fungi. Under every footstep that you take, and that's all over the world. The bulk of the organism is growing underground, and it's composed of these long threads called a mycelium. Almost everyone knows about the computer internet. The mycelium shares the same network design. It's amazing what we don't know about mushrooms. They really are a frontier of knowledge. You can filter water. You can create medicinal compounds almost on demand. They have incredible capacity to make things change very quickly. So I am super hopeful. The psychedelic members of the mushroom kingdom are fascinating. I have been a guide for around 350 psilocybin sessions. The most glorious part was that it made me feel more comfortable with living because you're not afraid of dying. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? We can heal the planet. We can build the future. And our world is fantastic. Yeah.
it's a, an amazing film. And not only is the story amazing and accurate, but the photography is mind blowing. And this is due to a fellow named Louis Schwartzberg. Louis has pioneered uh, filming things over time. And so you'll see stuff you've never seen before. If you've seen it before, you were sitting in a forest for, you know, three months or 30 years uh, having a look at it. So just for the visual effects alone, it's worth it. And, you know, just put science in a really compelling way, as all scientists uh, would like to do, but very seldom are, are able to do. But this gets back to this idea of using these plants of the gods for therapeutic purposes. You know, I came of age in the 70s and hallucinogens were you know, considered bad or illegal in many cases and got more and more illegal. Nixon's ridiculous war on drugs. Uh, the best comment I saw on that on Twitter recently is like, the war on drugs, the drugs won. So that now you have cannabis becoming legal in, in more and more places almost every day. Psilocybin becoming legal in, in, in more and more places all the time. But from a therapeutic perspective, this is becoming mainstreamed in Western medicine. So you have what Western doctors have long called incurable diseases like PTSD, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, end of life anxiety, which are really responding to these therapeutic compounds. I mean, they're, they're not a panacea, okay? But cases that were considered intractable that, you know, that they weren't responding to Western treatment or responding in some of the cases, very exciting time. I mean, all of us have picked up a newspaper or magazine, looked at a website. It's like magic mushrooms induce spiritual experiences. Uh, LSD opens new uh, opportunities for treating uh, psychological problems. Well, as the shamans would say, hello. I mean, they've been doing this all along. You have to remember that mind-altering substances in the hands of a skilled practitioner or a shaman where I work are essentially biological scalpels which allows them to analyze, treat, and sometimes cure afflictions of the mind that our own medicine cannot. So the future is bright, and we're going to see more and more of this. And even going back to absinthe, which was banned uh, for decades, uh, is now available. And not for any particular therapeutic purpose, unless you regard liquor as a very effective treatment in moderate doses for stress, which I certainly do. Uh, that the, 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 the demand and market is going to only increase. And we have a question, what percent of Thujon is in modern absinthe? Is it different from yeah, yeah. distillation? And scientists have found bottles of absinthe from 100, 200 years ago. And the results I've seen is that the uh, preparation is not that different uh, in terms of the percentage of alcohol, percentage of Thujon, so it wasn't a case of saying, yeah, you know, in the old days, it had so much thuhon in it, it would rock your world. But now they've got most of it out, so it's completely different. From what I've seen, it seems pretty, pretty similar. Now, you have people jacking up the alcohol content, which makes it more powerful, more addictive. But it doesn't really change the essentials, which is distillate of wormwood. Yeah, I've seen this, uh, that the thuhon is considered the, the, the bad actor, the compound that's addictive, the thing that's... Uh, psychoactive, and as I said, in in everything I've read, it's it's not. It's just a flavoring agent. And uh, you know the reason that all absinths don't taste identical; they taste fairly similar because you get that licorice taste, is because it depends on the herbs going into it. It's not just wormwood. Each di distiller uh, makes their own batch or their own recipe, and that's why you get these you know subtle differences, which is what makes it appealing. You know, I mean, imagine if, I mean, when I was a kid, we drank Bacardi's rum, white rum. That was it. Didn't know what a dark rum was. Imagine how many dark rums are out there now. And 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 they, they taste differently. And, you know, people drink them for different purposes. Some expensive rums, uh, like my my favorite rum in the world, which is Ron Añeje de Caldas uh, from Colombia. That's a sipping rum, you know. I mean, you can make rum and Coke, but what's the point? On the other hand, my, my pal Beach Bumberry's rum is is my uh, my rum of choice for mixing tiki drinks uh, because it's a very strong rum that stands up to the powerful flavors in tropical juices like pineapple and coconut. How about you, Antonio? What's your favorite rum these days? My favorite rum these days? That's a good question. 
I just got back from Suriname with you for the first time, and I had uh, Borgu rum for the first time, and I got to say it's a contender. Yep, all of these uh, slave-holding countries, uh, you know, there's, no, there's not, nothing positive to say about uh, slavery, of course, but uh, it inculcated a rum culture, just like uh, the French army tradition introduced and inculcated an absinthe culture in uh, France and then spread throughout the rest of Europe and to New Orleans, which is the most European city. So uh, do we have any more questions as we wind up here, Antonio? So at, the, at the moment, we don't have any more questions and we are, you know, about getting ready to wrap up. Oh, here we have one. Yeah. Yes, I have not studied the effects of pulque, but I've drunk lots of pulque in Mexico. So I think like absinthe, uh, there's a lot of stories about what it does differently. Uh, it's the alcohol that's giving you the buzz. And, uh, you know, Puk is not a very high uh, alcohol content drink, so you got to drink a lot of it uh, to catch that buzz. But, you know, if you're an ethnobotanist, you want to try all of these uh, indigenous uh, herbal concoctions and preparations, whether it's ayahuasca or pulque, um, to see what the effect is and what the taste is. And I have to say that uh, pulque is an acquired taste. Um, but the, the expert on these drinks of that part of the world is Gary Nabhan, N-A-B-H-A-N, who's written about pulque and tequila uh, and all the other drinks from those, those parts of, of Mexico. Fascinating read, fascinating story. Okay. Um, I think we're winding up here. And I yeah. want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to thank uh, our, our, our team at Deb Mitchell Associates, including Deb Mitchell, for making this possible. I want to thank Antonio of the Amazon Conservation Team. So I want to encourage everybody to check out our Plants of the Gods podcast and all the major platforms, Stitcher, um, Apple Podcasts. Um, check out the Amazon Conservation Team website, amazonteam.org. Check out my personal website, uh, markplotkin.com. And I just, my most recent piece is a profile of Richard Schultes, the father of ethnobotany, Harvard Magazine, harvardmagazine.com. Look it up. And there's a video interview with me talking about Schultes' life and legacy. This is the man who brought mescaline, uh, psilocybin, and ayahuasca to the attention of the wider world. So that's a feat that will never be equaled or exceeded by any other ethnobotanist. Quite an interesting tale. But uh, I want to thank everybody who has uh, joined us. Um, I encourage you to put in where you've dialed in from. That's useful for us in terms of demographics and, and, and outreach. I also want to proudly point out that we don't take commercial advertising. You, you don't see me holding up a bottle of something and saying, buy this brand. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that contributes to the popularity of Plants of the Gods podcast. No commercial interruptions. How many of us have fallen in love with a particular podcast and dialed in every week? And then every week they start having more and more and more and more commercials. Uh, MSNBC is the same way. So we want you to give you the straight information without having you to sit through uh, commercials for anything. And that's been the idea to uh, teach, to listen, to learn. I enjoy the questions. And sometimes it makes me think of things that... The, the role of ethnobotany in, in films. I mean, I might end up doing a podcast on that. I, I thank our colleague for raising that issue. It's a great story. And there'll be some great visuals that go along with us. So join us, support our work by supporting the Amazon Conservation Team. Um, we're a public charity. All donations are tax deductible. And it's the support uh, and encouragement of, of folks like you that make our work possible. We have partnered with over 90 South American tribes to map, manage, improve protection of over 100 million acres of Amazonian forest, and we're not done yet. As you know, the situation in Amazonia is pretty dire, but we've just begun to fight. So join with us and stick with us. And, uh, you know, when I got in this business 40 years ago, I used to say, I want to make the world a better place. Well, now I got a lot more dense in my fender. So I say, well, I'll settle for making the world a less bad, bad place. Uh, that's where I am these days. But uh, like I said, be involved. The environment is too important to be left to environmentalists. Write your congressperson, run for office. You know, don't put up with any of the crap that's being foisted on us by a lot of politicians. Gun control, stuff like that. We need your help to do the right thing.
So join us in our efforts because the shamans say it's all the same thing. Whether you're protecting rainforest, whether you're helping minorities in the inner city, whether you're fighting climate change, um, it all ties together. That's what the shamans have told me, and that's what I'm sharing with you. Thanks and good night. Thank you.